Today we are talking about something I have been wanting to talk about for a very long time. If you follow me on socials you know that I talk about this a lot anyway. Besides my first ever video that I did, this is without a doubt the video slash videos I've been most desperate to do. Now my plan is 13 pages long. Okay. So just a bit of introduction. This is definitely going to be a series, probably about five or six videos, probably seven because of the amount that I talk. How to introduce what this series is about in a sentence. Um, the fashion industry is extremely destructive and I feel like not many people know about it. There's a lot of things that people and me don't know about, but when you weigh it up with how big of a problem, like how much we consume it, and how fast it's growing, I see it as a very urgent thing to talk about. Fast fashion is a term you may or may not have heard used before. And in order to talk about it at all, I need to first explain what it is. So what is fast fashion? The Google definition of fast fashion is inexpensive clothing produced rapidly by mass market retailers in response to the latest trends. There are different definitions, but they all have the same elements. The key elements to fast fashion as a concept and defining fast fashion is clothing made quickly. A fundamental aspect of fast fashion is that the supply chain is quick. The manufacturing process is extremely quick. It's only a matter of days or a few weeks where a product goes from being an idea, an original idea, to being on the shelf. The supply chain is made as, sh as efficient and quick as possible. Clothing that ultimately copies high-end trends. That might be something you hear and feel a bit surprised to hear because... And I, I kind of was as well, like I didn't realise it was so important to the business model to be like part of the definition. But that is primarily what fast fashion does if you think about it. Certain people in society that are trendsetters, let's say Kim Kardashian, Beyonce, uh, Kylie Jenner, for example, off the top of my head. Um, so a lot of times trends will start when people like this wear something that's been made by a designer brand, because obviously they're not going to Primark. But then that's when all the brands come in and, and copy it. All the things you see in the shops were originally made to mimic catwalk trends. Affordable clothing. Let me just say that it's brands that the average person wouldn't view as affordable can still be fast fashion. Urban Outfit is, is an example. It counts because, well, it copies trends. Clothing is made quickly to, ma to meet trends and also clothing is still affordable when compared with the environmental and literal labour that's gone into it. So although it's not as affordable as somewhere like Primark, it's still too cheap. Like... Urban Outfitters is a tricky one. I'll, I'll talk about it more later. I will talk about it more later, right? The way that they meet these key elements, as I've kind of touched on, is by cutting corners, particularly the affordability and the speed. I mentioned this in my first video. It's cheaper to not be responsible. It's cheaper to not spend money doing things properly. It's expensive to be ethical and responsible. Expensive to them because they don't want to be spending money in the first place. This cutting corners is what I'm going to talk about because it's the problem with the industry. But, well, one of them. But includes things like uh, not looking after workers, not paying them enough, not, not making the conditions good enough, making clothing bad quality, not having proper ways to dispose of their chemical waste, their fabric waste, not having clean technologies in their manufacturing because to invest in these things would cost more money. Fast fashion hasn't always been 
uh, a thing hasn't always been how people access clothing the model has changed a lot let's start with before the industrial revolution right vaguely before the mid 1700s it was harder to find information on this era than it was uh, everything after this but in short uh, lots of people used to make their clothes. Other people would make or buy their clothes. It was a process done with a lot of uh, care and thought behind it. People would get clothing tailored. People would get clothing repaired or repair their clothes. My guess is in any given year, the average person would have maybe two new items of clothing, probably made by them. We will get on to what that figure is now later. It seems to me that before the industrial revolution not a lot of importing and exporting happened in terms of things like wool and cotton if you wanted to make clothes you would have to have sheep and uh, get the wool yourself or grow cotton so now we come to the industrial revolution which was around about the mid 1700s to the mid 1800s towards the beginning of the industrial revolution we still haven't birthed proper mass production we, we haven't got huge factories full of hundreds of people yet at this point low-income groups are still making their own clothes sometimes they would have people called sweaters um who would make clothing from their homes for quite low wages that is also quite important to note so we're still quite local and i just say i really love history i had a really um fun time researching this the industrial revolution was when a lot of things changed was when mass production started to become a thing because of the introduction of certain machinery such as sewing machines and factories where you would have a number of workers in the same place There's a lot of information out there that I came across about the about poor working conditions in the Industrial Revolution particularly. This era was quite notorious for it in certain countries, such as our own. This is a very significant manifestation of the concept of profit over people and also planet and everything else um, that we see very, very prominently today in the fashion industry and many, 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 many other industries. During this era, from what I could tell from my research, raw materials were starting to be imported from other countries like India, like colonies, basically. There are links to slavery with that as well. Um, I will get into that stuff later in another video. Clothes are still not affordable. From my research, it seems that the 1900s, the beginning of the 20th century, was when dressmakers and clothing stores became a thing and became popular. Not as we know them now. There are typically four seasons of clothing, spring, summer, autumn and winter. As developments in machinery and efficiency and all these things and technologies uh, progressed, clothing became quicker and easier to make and as a result became cheaper and cheaper. The demand for affordable clothing increases, keeps increasing. In the early 1900s, all sorts of labour in all sorts of industries um, began to be outsourced to other countries, including former colonies, because it was cheaper. Important. So just a little example, um, until the 1960s, 90% of clothing sold in, America, in the US was made domestically in the US. Now, in 2020, is 3% made in the US. And as you can guess, the other 97% is made in other countries. 
So since about the 40s, there are a few small shops existing which later turn into ones that we know. So H&M, I think, was founded in the 40s, but at this stage, they're still quite small. But then in the 60s and 70s, lots more clothing shops were founded, um, particularly European. For example, Zara was founded, um, Primark and Topshop and uh, Uniqlo were also founded in this kind of era. This is when supply chains started to really speed up and become more efficient. This particular change was uh, actually pioneered by Zara, who found a way to make their supply chain so efficient and quick response to trends that clothing production was much 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 more efficient and they were able to get clothes out on the shelf much faster and as a result of this there was increased demand for more seasons of clothing nowadays there are about in most popular clothing shops there are about 52 seasons which yes is one a week um and if you notice in a lot of popular brands if, if you go in one week and go in the next there's a bunch of new stuff so yeah, this ability to replicate trends in an extremely fast way made it possible to have new lines of clothing in more regularly. This, as you could probably guess, proves to be extremely profitable for Zara because the reason it's done is to expand the profit margin. Lots of brands, as a result, copy this. And this is kind of when a lot of those brands become a lot more popular. In the 1990s, a lot of these brands enter more middle class, more globalised markets. A lot of these shops landed in New York in the 90s, for example, Zara. And this is actually when the term fast fashion was first used. It was used by the New York Times to describe Zara's ability to get a garment from the design stage to the shelf in 15 days which for the 90s is extremely impressive. Now every brand is able to do that. So at this point, we have lots of clothing stores, physical stores that are extremely popular in countries like the US, in, like, in the Western world. In the late 90s, a few clothing stores branch out to websites. Now, from my research, it seems like Topshop was the first to do this, which surprised me. I can't really imagine a clothing website in the 90s. A few of the websites cropped up in the 90s, not the majority of them. In about 2000, because of these chains' popularity in country, in other countries like the US, and an ever-increasing number of different countries this is when they really really take off one of the reasons for this that i came across in my research was that at a time like the mid 1900s it might have been frowned upon to wear cheap clothing presumably because it was associated with being lower class but during this time during the late 1900s this kind of stigma had largely gone away and there was a new demand for it there's a lot of possible reasons for that but in 2000 lots of these brands are huge many other brands now have successful online stores fashion brands that are exclusively online such as boohoo asos nastigal are founded in this kind of era In the 2010s, kind of, is when lots of social media started popping up, specifically Instagram. In this same kind of era, lots more online shops start popping up, like Opoly, like Miss Pat, like Shen, like Zaful, which are often exclusively online. In 2012, Pretty Little Thing was founded from my perspective of the fashion industry currently pretty little thing seems to be one of the biggest retailers so online fashion now is really really starting to um explode just to compare in the year 2015 
12% of clo all clothing was bought online. In the year 2018, three years later, 24% of clothing was bought online. Don't know the figure for 2020, but I'm sure it is probably something like 50 or 60. Between this that kind of era and now, Instagram and social media has continued to gain popularity and the influence of social media is something I will get to in a later video. With this increased popularity came a lot of Instagram boutiques. I comment on a lot of brands posts asking about the truth behind how they're made. As a result, I get a lot of ads, but it really, really just shows to me how many different brands there are now and how easy it seems to be to create a clothing brand. Social media has been extremely influential in that way. Also, there's the rise of influencers, who uh, advertise and promote many of these bland brands like Pretty Little Thing. There's the use of just general advertising on social media. So the rise of social media, in my view, was one of the biggest turning points, along with the Industrial Revolution and the change in traditional supply chains pioneered by Zara are the key things that shaped the way that the industry operates, how that's changed. If you want more detail about how fashion industry is now, then keep watching the series. But for now, I want to get on to specific brands. Who are the main culprits? Who are the most important brands in influencing some of these changes? Just to give a little information to make parts of this series make more sense. The brands Zara, Pull&Bear, Bershka, Stradvarius and a few other ones that I haven't heard of are owned by Inditex. Okay, remember that. Boohoo, Pretty Little Thing, Nasty Gal and Miss Pap are owned by Boohoo Group. Topshop, Topman, Miss Selfridge, Dorothy Perkins and a few others that are less well known are owned by Arcadia Group. In terms of the brands that have had the most influence over the history, H&M is technically speaking the longest what we now know as fast fashion brand because it was formed in 1940s. I don't... However, when it comes to the production aspect of, of clothing, which is where most of the damage happens, the biggest pioneer is Zara in that aspect because, as I mentioned, they revolutionised the way the supply chain operated made it more efficient and faster so that they could respond to high-end trends a lot faster and as a result have a lot more clothing ranges come in. As far as my research tells me, the presence of online fashion was pioneered by ASOS which also was founded quite early on and uh, Boohoo Group. Although Topshop technically had the first online uh, website from what I can tell. I think these these brands just took it to another level, are largely responsible for the popularity of uh, ordering online and online fashion. So many of the first successful fashion brands were European. So Zara is Spanish, uh, H&M is Swedish. It is hard to get a completely accurate detailed timeline of all of these brands, which came first, that is the summary. I will state the brands that I see as the main culprits just based on my perception of them as being some of the biggest fashion brands existing right now but I should probably say that this list is not going to be completely accurate because this is from a British perspective so I don't know if I lived in the US if I would view the same brands as being the most successful ones there's probably huge Japanese brands huge Chinese brands huge American brands that I don't know about This is not in order, but Inditex is actually ranked as 
the number one um, in terms of profit is the biggest fashion parent company in the world. So from my perspective, other brands that are extremely included in the concept of fast fashion are Primark, which is originally an Irish brand, uh, H&M Swedish, Pretty Little Thing, which is British, ASOS, which is British, Topshop, which is British, Zara, which is Spanish, Uniqlo, which is Japanese, Forever 21, which is American, and Urban Outfitters, which is American. I'm pretty sure I've forgotten a lot of big, big brands, but when I think of fast fashion, those are some of the first brands I think of. I also haven't mentioned uh, brands like Nike and Adidas, Sports Direct, all that stuff, because I have not fully done my research into them. They're, they're more than just fast fashion brands because obviously their focus is slightly different and it may, may well be the fact that they're just as bad, but I have not looked into it. Those are the main points for this video. Um, I do also want to say, just for the sake of transparency, I own clothes from all of the brands I just mentioned because a year ago, slash two years ago, I was um, very into buying clothes, buying new things, retail therapy, even this top is a H&M top. But something, I, something I'm going to mention in probably the last video of the series when I talk about how we can move forward is the importance of looking at the clothes we have now. And ideally, I wouldn't be wearing clothes from these brands, but these are clothes I have, these are clothes I've bought in the past, I don't buy from these brands anymore. Just so everyone knows, my wardrobe is not full of ethical brands. I ha my wardrobe is majority made up of these brands. That is the end of this video of the series. The next video I'm going to get into what is the problem with these brands, i.e. the whole reason for doing this series. That probably will be two or three videos because there's a lot to say. But if you want to hear the main part of uh, this series, then keep on watching. Thank you if you've made it to the end of this depressing video, which is not as depressing as some of the videos coming. The last video of the series will be the uh, least depressing of the series. So if that is any incentive to watch it all. <laughs> Thanks again to anyone who's watched any of my videos and shared any of my videos, liked any of my videos, subscribed as well. I can't see who everyone who subscribed is, but thank you for subscribing. Stay tuned for the next one. I'm going to try to make these as not depressing as possible. I will try and make it somewhat enjoyable to watch.